I wonder whether our definition of AGI, the the kind of the classic de classical definition, if we can call it that, you know, a few years old, whatever, is still even relevant now, or whether the ecosystem is becoming so nebulous that actually, you know, AG, the, the term AGI making it kind of esoteric to humans, actually maybe is less and less relevant. What's what's your feeling on that? Do you are you still are you still thinking about AGI, and if so, how close are we? Yeah, so uh, I kind of alluded to my my personal litmus test earlier. <clears throat> Pardon me, and that is I look at uh, economic usefulness and scientific usefulness. So some of the tweets and and you know private messages that I got after O1 Preview came out. Here, let me give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine is uh, one of the top researchers in oceanography, specifically computational fluid dynamics, and he texted me a day after O1 Preview was rolled out. And he said, oh, you know, here's here's a uh, here's a problem that I gave it. And it was the the most jargon heavy prompt I have ever seen um, in terms of, you know, all of these postulates and mathematical, uh, you know, approaches to, you know, uh, sim basically simulating fluids. And he said, you know, it, it almost got it right the first time. And with a, just a little bit of correction, it got it right the second time. And so he said, yeah, it's it's about where like a good grad student is. Um, and many, many other people have said, you know, similar things. There was a few posts on Reddit where someone said, um, you know, it did, it did my entire PhD, um, dissertation in an hour and it took me a year. Um, now, of course that was someone guiding it with a problem that they already knew how to solve. Um, many, many people basically kind of where we've converged on is from a scientific standpoint, O one one preview is about as useful as a good grad student. Um, and that kind of more subjective, uh, kind of, I don't, I don't want to say vague, but more like a fuzzy definition of like, oh, hey, in my mind, this has as much value, as much utility as a good grad student, but it runs 24 seven. And it, I don't know, I don't know if it's cheaper. Um, I guess grad students are often paying to be there. So <laughs> it's much more expensive than a, than a grad student who's paying to be at a, at a university, but that price is going to come down. Yeah. And then uh, furthermore, you look at how uh, many developers uh, have reacted to O1 Preview, where some say it's still not that good. Um, in some cases, I think it's user error. Um, you know, there might be some unconscious bias to like kind of sabotage the, the, the machine by giving it a bad prompt and saying, ah, look, it didn't do any good. But then I've right. seen plenty yeah. more people say, hey, it just solved this API problem that I've had for a week and it did it in 30 seconds flat and people are just completely floored by it. Um, so I suspect that, um, oh, and then one other thing is kind of the the red herring, no true Scotsman fallacy, which is, well, it's not actually intelligent. It's not actually thinking. It's like, yeah, but the output is measurable and the output is measurably useful and accurate. Um, so I, I tend to default to what is measurable about it? Like, how does it perform on benchmarks? How does it perform on IQ tests? And that's one thing, but then the actual impact to the scientific community the actual impact to businesses, that's really what people are going to care about from a policy perspective, from an economic perspective, and so on and so forth. Now, that's a very long-winded way of saying most people are, everyone has their own opinion about what AGI means, but at the end of the day, it's going to be about dollars and cents, really, is kind of what it comes yeah. down to. And so so it's, I think it's, I, I saw a, a, an IQ bell curve that placed all the and and it, I think it was from an IQ test that's not published online. So you can have, you, you can kind of assume that it's it's really it, it really is measuring reasoning rather than just having read all of the IQ questions before. Um, and I think it was around about 120. Is that the the level that you're um, understanding? Yeah, I mean, when you think that the average um, average uh, college graduate has an IQ of about 120, that that checks out. You know, yeah. if it's if it's if it's a good grad student. Um, but again, here's another thing is where anthropomorphizing these machines can be dangerous is because let's say, for instance, there's a subject um, or a topic or a particular cognitive approach that it wasn't trained on or that it that it hasn't seen before. This is why you still see problems where it just kind of falls down flat. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, tests that I did with O1 Preview was I asked it to speculate about the interaction of different technologies in the future. Um, and it just, I gave it like four, four class of, uh, four categories of technology and four areas to evaluate impact. And it just did one to one to one to one. So I, you know, four by four, it gave me 16 little evaluations about 
what impact each of those one combinations could have. And I said, I, I just insulted it. I was like, you're being lazy. Like you're, you're not actually adding any, any value. And then, it, then it insulted me back saying, let me clarify my communication for this stupid human. And I said, you're not synthesizing anything new. And it said, oh, I understand what you want. You want me to synthesize something new. And it still completely failed at the task. I took the same exact original prompt and gave it to Claude. And Claude was like, this is a fun experiment. Let's figure out how these things are going to change society. Um, so again, because of because they're trained differently, they've been uh, fine-tuned differently, you can still get very different behavior out of these machines. Um, and, and so long story short, O1 preview, when it comes to um, forecasting technological impacts scores way, way, way lower than uh, than Claude does still today. Right. But at the same time, it's economically useful in many other ways. Yeah. Yeah, I think the other thing just on, on the AGI terminology is I kind of feel like sometimes it leads us down, down rabbit holes about, you know, embodiment, you know, which really is a robotics question or, you know, like agency, which, okay, that's, that's relevant, but I don't think that's necessarily about raw intelligence. And for me, you know, AGI really is, has always been a kind of description of general, generalized intelligence, right? So I, mm -hmm. I just wonder whether the terminology itself is becoming kind of outdated, particularly as we're going to get increasingly more and more specialized models that are really, really amazing at one particular thing. You know, there'll probably be an oceanography model, right, at some point where it's just got lots and lots of it. It's not multimodal. It's not got all of this other random stuff that it doesn't need to know. It's just got loads of like ocean data and then it becomes really, really good at that. Far better than any human, very specialized. Um, and we'll be at a stage where, yes, most models are at least as clever as a human, but it almost doesn't matter. You know, I, yeah. I don't know whether you agree with that. Well, so, I mean, we, we don't even have to guess. We can see, we can look at the industry and where it's going. So I've got a few examples. So Google okay. DeepMind, they have been working on AlphaFold. So AlphaFold, uh, for anyone who is not familiar, is a protein folding um, AI model. That's all it does. Um, there was a open, uh, sorry, a decentralized computing project called Folding at Home, which allowed you to help uh, participate in, you know, massive open source research about folding proteins. So running little tiny simulations, um, you know, with spare compute cycles on your laptop or desktop or whatever, or your servers to figure out how, uh, how fo proteins fold together, how they misfold and that sort of thing. Um, the reason that that's important is because if a, the way that a protein folds, um, determines how well it functions, uh, if it's dysfunctional, um, and also how proteins fit together. So basically that is the basis of all life, of all biology, including all medicine and all disease models. So then along comes DeepMind with AlphaFold, which um, is able to do this. Uh, they were able to create a library of, what was it? It was hundreds of thousands of proteins. Um, and they were able to get uh, state-of-the-art uh, 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 accuracy in terms of how proteins fold. Um, but they were able to do it much faster and much cheaper than old, uh, older methods. Then you combine that with their latest model, Alpha Proteo, which is about basically, I need a protein that you know binds to X, Y, and Z receptors, design the protein for me. This is something that was just not really possible. This, is, this, this one technology represents a step change in terms of what is possible with synthetic biology. Um, so that is a highly, highly specialized model. And you might say, ah, well, if it was you know, general intelligence that it should have that ability, but humans don't even have that ability. Um, we have to use high powered computation and simulation and, you know, in this case, advanced artificial intelligence models to achieve that. Um, and then another way of looking at this is Jim Fan from NVIDIA, who was formerly um, at OpenAI, or I don't know if he was at OpenAI, but he was mentored by both Ilya Sutskever and Andre Karpathy. And so what he's working on now is a foundation model for robots. And he was just on uh, Sequoia Capital's podcast of all places um, just a couple days ago. And he was saying that we're about, you know, two to three years away from general purpose humanoid robots. So there's the hardware layer. And that we're also about two to three years away from a general purpose AI or a, a robotic foundation model. So basically a, a, a droid brain that you can put into any robot, whether it's quadruped or bipedal or whatever, and that it can effectively navigate the world negotiate complex de dexterous tasks like imagine everything that goes into building a house 
you have to use a bunch of tools. You have to move heavy uh, materials around. You have to, you know, have fine motor coordination to put in plumbing and wiring, those sorts of things. That is going to be adjacent to, that's going to be parallel to the AGI, which is basically kind of, I characterize it as a genius in a jar, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you have a model that has an IQ of 150 or 250, it still needs peripherals. So it needs to tell the robot what to build. But to your point, and I do agree with you, so that this is kind of what I've been building up to, is that the most useful things, some of the most useful things that AI can do don't really require embodiment. So that's coding. You don't need a body to do coding. You don't need a body to do advanced chemistry or advanced physics or advanced math. A lot of the most challenging and highly intellectual tasks that we do, a body is more of an impediment <laughs> than, than, a, than, a, than a, a superpower. Um, navigating the physical world that you know you and I can do, your dog can do, monkeys and octopuses can do. Evolution has solved that problem you know, a billion years ago, basically, um, because this is where we started. The intellectual uh, activity of humans, this is a relatively new invention. Um, and so now we're just extending our own cognitive abilities with machines. Um, that's kind of mm -hmm. the model that I have in terms of understanding what we're building and why.